Bienvenidos, señoras y señores, to the Bleed Lows podcast. And right before we get into the show, let's just take care of some business here. Uh, basketball is back, and Bet Online remains your number one source for all your sports betting needs this season. You'll find the latest odds, team matchup info, player news, game trends at Bet Online. And as your continued source for all your sports wagering information, Bet Online features live betting, free contests, and giveaways all season long. It's always the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports and events. Whether that's NFL, NBA, NHL, MMA, tennis, boxing, or even golf. So head to betonline.ag to join and receive your 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. Make sure to use the promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, to receive your rewards. Bet online where the game starts. And uh, joining us this week, um, we're going to do a little bit of a uh, cross promotion here. This is like uh, the Flintstones. No, no, it's the Jetsons meet the Pica Piedras. That, that's what we're going to go ahead and do. Uh, joining us, the host of the podcast, uh, Locked on Dodgers, uh, Jeff Snyder. Jeff, you also uh, are you also a still a, a contributor to Dodgers Nation? I am. Yeah, I talk about the Dodgers and I write about the Dodgers and uh when I'm not doing either of those things, I'm thinking about the Dodgers. And you yeah, can call so, me El Elroy Jetson. <laughs> there we go. Elroy Jetson. There we go. We're going to go with that. With Jeff. That's Spanish well, we, for the Roy Jetson. <laughs> we we want to have Jeff on because Jeff, I, I mean, I, I, I want you to take this as a compliment, Jeff, because I okay. feel <laughs> like you are very knowledgeable. And I know you're a fan, but you don't sound like a fan when you talk about the Dodgers. And that's why I want you to take it as a compliment. Like, look, we lose our shit every time the Dodgers lose, you know. And I feel whenever you talk about the Dodgers, you come from a rational point of view. Am I wrong in that assessment? I, I hope you're not. That's my goal. Uh, the, these gray hairs you see in this beard, I earn those things. I am old and hopefully wise. You know, I, I've, uh, I've learned over the years that I don't have the energy to get upset every single time the Dodgers lose. I have to save that energy for when they lose in October. <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm less rational then. And even then, you know, I, I believe you know, I, I believe in data. I believe in information, and I believe that uh, decisions made on bad information are, by definition, bad decisions. And so, you know, when when, when people overreact to anything, you know, it, uh, July twenty third loss to the to the Braves because Dave Roberts brought in the wrong reliever. You know, it's like, okay, first of all, it's one game, and second of all are you sure Dave Roberts messed up? Because, you know, and, and that's kind of my biggest thing, maybe where I depart from most Dodger fans is I don't actually believe there are very many right and wrong decisions that managers make. Mm -hmm. I believe that it's a spectrum and, you know, most decisions, well, there, there's right decisions and wrong decisions and every manager gets all of those right. You know, like, sh should I bat, uh, should I bat Evan Phillips leadoff? Nope, you shouldn't do that. Okay, I didn't do that. All right. But I think most of the actual decisions that managers make in a game, it's like, okay, which reliever do I bring in? Do I let my starter go one more inning? All those things, it's like, okay, it's like a 55% chance of, of being the quote-unquote right decision and 45% chance of being wrong. But that means even if you get it right, there's a 45% chance that it's going to go poorly. you know. And so if you're just basing all of your – frustration on what happened in this game well you know what sometimes managers make all the right calls and the players just don't get it done on the field you know sometimes the players go over 20 with runners in scoring position in a postseason series and you know that's why you lose a series and not because of some inconsequential managerial decision in the last game of the series i don't know so yeah i i do try to I, I believe rational is the way to live a happy life because you're more likely to make good decisions and you're less likely to uh, die of high blood pressure because you're letting yourself get upset about every little thing. That, that, that's beautiful. Uh, you, you led me into many different paths, but the one that I want to start with because it just ended was the world series. 
And looking at this World Series, to me, especially looking at these two teams, I see a lot of parallels uh, with, with the Dodgers there. So I, I want to get your, your, your thoughts on a couple of things. First of all, everything that you just said right now about making the right decisions. At Game 6, taking Wheeler out. Right. And of course, the uh, Thompson gets just destroyed. Right. And that to me, it's insert Dave Roberts. Right. It's uh, Dave Roberts pulling Anderson. So to me, it's one of those things where it's like as much as we want to crap on the Dodgers, this happens to every team who loses. OK, it's usually one team and even they'll get second guess. But every team that loses in the playoffs has a moment like this. So. Maybe now that we've had enough time, should we lay off of Dave Roberts or does he still deserve to be, you know, did he did he really get outmanaged by Bob Melvin in that series, Jeff? Uh, no, I, you know, I, I would have left Anderson in for another inning. But the thing is, the Dodgers didn't lose that game because they ran out of pitchers. It was because the pitchers they brought in didn't pitch well. And guess what? Tommy Canley was going to pitch in that game. Tommy Canley wasn't their eighth reliever on the roster. Tommy Canley was a high leverage reliever. And, and so he probably would have pitched that same inning, the seventh inning, because even if Anderson goes six innings, they brought in Canley because it was the, the bottom of the order. They're like, okay, this is where we want Canley. And, you know, if Canley comes in in that spot, no reason to think anything would have gone differently. Even if Anderson pitches that sixth inning that Chris Martin pitched, yeah, okay, so Chris Martin's available, and maybe they bring in Chris Martin instead of Yancy Almonte uh, after Canely crapped the bed, but it's not like Yancy Almonte pitched well or, or pitched poorly. He, he, like, There's so many little things that could have changed that game. If the umpire doesn't miss the strike one call to ha Hassan Kim, then it's a one and two count instead of two and one count, which means that Max Muncy isn't playing in to defend against the bunt which means that Kim's double down the left field line is probably a, a double play. It's a ground ball that Muncie Field steps on third, throws to first for a double play. Totally changes that inning. You know, and, and yeah, obviously that's not what happened. You can't say, well, you know, I'm not saying it's the umpire's fault or anything like that. I'm saying every little thing changed. Yeah, I would have done something differently with Tyler Anderson, but I'm not confident enough in my own intelligence to say that I'm right and Dave Roberts is wrong. And going back to Rob Thompson, the Phillies manager, he did the exact same thing in the last series, in the NLCS. He pulled Ranger Suarez after five innings and like 73 pitches or something, and he brought in the bullpen, and they won that game. And every single article the next day was, Rob Thompson went for it. He's in win-now mode. He's aggressive management of the bullpen, blah, blah, blah. All this positive stuff. If Jose Alvarado doesn't give up a three-run jack to Jordan Alvarez yesterday, it's the same thing. You know, yeah, Zach Wheeler was was cruising, but you know, uh, a lot of managers would have left Wheeler in there. But Thompson knew I had to go to my ace lefty reliever, and he came in and he struck out Alvarez. And you know, it's all about the performance on the field. That's what dictates it, and that's why all of these narratives are written after the fact. Where oh, because like that five run inning the Padres scored against the Dodgers, that doesn't happen very often. That was a crazy inning, and it wasn't because Tyler Anderson got pulled after five innings. It was uh, like a comedy of errors, just a, a huge combination of things. And the fact that afterwards the story was all about what happened two innings earlier with the pitching decision. It's like, yeah, even though I disagreed with the decision, I think it's going a bit far to say the Dodgers lost this game and this series because Dave Roberts pulled Tyler Anderson early. I just don't see it. No, nah, and and so that takes me now to the Astros, right? Baby face over here, I know, is just miserable because the Astros won a World Series. But look, take away what happened in 2017. This is a team that has been in the World Series four out of six years. And look, at, at one point or another, we have to take into account every every player we've talked to or former player we've talked to tells us, you know, there's a randomness to to baseball, especially the postseason, and I'm like, okay, you guys have played the game. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pay attention to what you're telling me. But if that's the case, I don't think there's randomness with the Astros. That's four out of six years that this team was in the World Series. Is it about time that we just give this team credit for for being good, Jeff? Yeah, I, I think you can give 
the 2022 Astros credit while still uh, not being totally forgiving of the 2017 Astros. And yeah, I mean, this was a very, very good team. Uh, there's zero reason to think that any of the issues from 2017 are still going on now because they have somebody with actual leadership skills uh, as the manager, which they didn't have in 2017. Dusty Baker's not going to stand for that. You know, I, I don't think Dusty Baker's a great manager, but I think he's uh, has integrity and leadership skills. And, you know, he wouldn't stand for what they did in 2017. So there's no reason to think there's any cheating going on. And they won 100 and, what, 106 games in the regular season and cruised through the postseason. And yeah, you know, it might have been different if they had had to play a better team in the World Series because it was the playoff weird format. The Phillies were the sixth best team. Sixth best, right? Six teams made yeah, the playoffs yeah. from each league. Yeah, yeah, the Phillies were the sixth best National League team to make the playoffs, and that's who the Astros got to play. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, the way that the, the the postseason has never really been about finding the best team. Ever since, right. basically since division play started in 1969. Uh, before that was, okay, best team in the National League plays the best team in the American League, and we can have a reasonable guess that, you know, at least one of the two best teams won the World Series. Uh, in this case, yeah, since they add, started adding more teams, and every time they add more teams, it makes it less and less likely that the best team is going to win win the World Series. Uh, and if you look at actual best regular season record, it's like 25% of the time that the best team wins the World Series. It didn't happen this year. Astros were the second best, just like they were in 2017 when they won it. But, I mean, you can make a pretty darn good case that this year's Astros team was very, very good. And they're obviously a well-run organization. They replaced Jeff Luno with, with what's his name, James Click, who came from the Rays. So, I mean, he obviously knows what he's doing. Uh, they replaced Carlos Correa with Jeremy Pena. And, you know, there's, yeah, other than the fact that I didn't want to see Astros fans be happy about anything, and I didn't want Alex Bregman and his comically large head on his comically tiny body to, to have anything good happen for him. Yeah, I mean... Astros are a good team, and they deserve to win the World Series. Babyface, what, what do you got to say about your Astros winning the World Series? No, I mean, I'm one of those, yeah, and I'm in that camp too. Okay, yeah, they won, right? They, they're they a good team. But what we discussed previously, once something that has happened, whether, you know, you your player that's done steroids or you've done something that Astros cheated, right? We know the Astros cheated, so that's always going to be in the back of your mind, like, Okay, yeah, they won, but you know, it, it's just it's just something that happens. You're just always going to question it. I mean, yeah, I'm in the same boat as Jeff. I don't think Dusty Baker would stand for anything like that. But you're always going to hey, they could do some, the players could do something. You know, you, you never know. But as as of now, it's a legit title, and you know, we'll see in three or four years if anything comes out. But as of now. They, they won. <laughs> it's so and hard I, for you, right, to give them credit. Just give them credit, man. And I think it would be it, easier in like another couple of years from now because right now there's still Bregman and Altuve and Guriel, you know, I, and I think then on, I think it's just those three on the offensive side and then Verlander and, and McCullers on the pitching side. I think that's it that's left from the 2017 team. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it's once all of those guys are gone – and it's just the same uniform, I think it'll be easier for people. But the fact that there are still some Astros left from the cheating team, uh, it, I think it does make it hard for some people to uh, to accept it. And I, I totally understand that. You know, we started off the show, Jeff, with you talking about, you know, uh, being a, a practical fan. I, I want to talk to you about fan tex uh, toxicity. Uh, because I feel like the way that the Dodgers went out this year, I, I felt that, and I don't know if you got it on, on your show, but to me, it felt like the fans were really, really angry. And to me, it felt like, oh, it's going to take them a while to, to get over this. And I saw it after the Astros won the World Series. There were a bunch of Dodger fans going, congratulations to Dusty. I'm happy for Dusty. But, you know, the rest of the Astros, Astros can can go screw themselves, you know. People are, are are still angry. Are we are we just taking this too far? Because it feels like 
nobody likes baseball. I feel like everybody just likes bitching about baseball. It's just like, yeah, our team hasn't won. But guess what? In the like, what what is it now? The last 34 years, our team hasn't won 32 out of those 34 teams. Uh, 34 years. I mean, we should be used to this by now. Yeah. Uh, one thing that really stands out to me is I feel like a lot of Dodger fans have exposed themselves as kind of believing the garbage narrative about 2020 the fact the Dodgers won the World Series two years ago and a lot of people make intellectually dishonest arguments that that championship wasn't legitimate because of the shortened season it's ridiculous the Dodgers were going to make the postseason you know it's not like oh they only snuck into the post you know who only snuck into the postseason because of the shortened season the Astros they snuck <laughs> in because the the expanded playoffs that year they were below 500 uh, and probably if they had had 162 games, maybe they sneak in deservedly. Uh, but the the fact is, the Dodgers didn't make the playoffs because of the 60 game season. And once you're in, they had the hardest postseason in history. They are the only team that has ever won 13 games in the postseason in one year. That was what it took. And 11 of those wins came at a neutral site, living in a hotel in a bubble. Like it was the hardest postseason ever. And the Dodgers won the World Series and uh, playing the same rules as all other all the other teams. The only way a World Series is illegitimate is if one team is playing by different rules. That's why 2017 is different, because the Astros were the only ones playing by Astros rules. But 2020, all 30 teams played by the same rules. That title is so legitimate, maybe more legitimate than most. But now we're seeing Dodger fans saying, man, all, in the last 34 years, all we have is one shortened season World Series. Like, we have one World Series, and it was two years ago, people. Like, have a little, like, perspective and recognize, yeah, I mean, all of us are old enough to remember, like, I, I used to joke with my Braves fan friends in the 90s, like, well, at least the Dodgers have the decency to not get my hopes up, you know? <laughs> well, the Dodgers, they get our hopes up every year. And I honestly believe fans would prefer if the Dodgers missed the playoffs than for them to lose in the division series. And even to lose in the World Series. Like, and for me, Tommy Lasorda said the best thing you can do in baseball is win the World Series. And the second best thing you can do is lose the World Series. And that's absolutely true. And yet, you look at 2017 and 2018, no Dodger fans, very few Dodger fans were happy about that. And yeah, I, I don't want to have a parade. I don't, I'm glad the Dodgers don't fly banners for you know, National League West champions and National League pennant, it's only World Series. And that's how it should be. Like a team with the Dodgers resources and all of that should be unhappy with anything other than World Series. But we won a World Series two years ago and have a very good chance to be fighting for it again next year. And that's the thing about the Dodgers. Every single year, the last decade, They've had a chance. We've had a team that we could actually enjoy watching for six months of the regular season while we're still kind of dreading the postseason. 2013, we weren't. We were just excited, you know? And, and I think through up until 2017, those first four years of this run, the Dodgers got eliminated, and yeah, it hurts, but it's like, okay, hey, good season, guys. Way to go. Once they got to the World Series, had the best record in baseball in 2017, got to the World Series, and lost in seven games – I think that changed things because now being that close, having it pulled away, I think that changed the psyche of Dodger fans where now anything other than a World Series is a disappointment. And I think for a lot of fans, they really believe that the season is a bust if you don't win the World Series. And for me, yeah, I was bummed. I'm still pretty bummed. It's been, what, three weeks now? And I'm still having a hard time with the fact that the Dodgers lost a series they should have won. And... I get that, but it doesn't change how much fun I had watching this team win 111 games in the regular season. And I don't mean that as a consolation prize or a participation trophy, but the regular season is part of the experience of being a fan. You watch them for six months. You go to the games. You have fun at Dodger Stadium. You feel the excitement, you know, the, and, and if you were to watch, you know, if, if you could, if the Dodgers had won the World Series, and so we were getting a Dodgers World Series DVD now, the regular season part of that DVD would be awesome. And we would have so much fun looking back at the crowd chanting Freddie, Freddie after that double back in April and, you know, all the different things. And we'd even have the, 
you know, the little lull in, in May where they kind of struggled a little bit and Dave Roberts kind of called them out and, you know, and then they go catch fire and dominate the league and all that stuff. That section of the World Series DVD would have been a lot of fun to watch. And that doesn't change just because they didn't win the World Series so we don't get the DVD. I still really, really enjoyed the six months and I'm looking forward to next year. And yeah, there will be that little bit of dread in the back of my mind like, uh, I really hope they can pull it out in October this year. But part of what I force myself to be rational about is I'm not going to think about October until then. That's their job to think about October when the time comes. Right now, I'm thinking I, I'm going to go down to Dodger Stadium this weekend. I'm going to go to a game. I love being at Dodger Stadium. I'm going to go enjoy watching the team, watching the best uniforms in baseball at the most beautiful stadium in baseball, putting a great team on the field, winning a bunch of games. There's not much you can ask for as a fan other than that. And, uh, yeah, hopefully – they can get their second World Series in four years next year, and maybe people will uh, appreciate it a little bit more. You know, uh, Babyface and I always uh, we go back and forth on this in the sense of you know it's been ten years of postseason uh, baseball, and it's like, would you trade two World Series championships in that same time frame, but you miss the playoffs five five years out of those ten? And I'm I'm guilty of this. I get caught up in the emotion of it. I, I'm miserable. I'm that guy who gets way too high and then gets way too low. But I'm sitting there watching Philly fan, right? Uh, and I feel like they they enjoy it more because they weren't in the playoffs for 11 years. They missed this. So it's like they were able to enjoy the moment of like, man, we, we might do it. We might do it. Meanwhile... I feel Dodger fans, and, and you hinted uh, uh, towards it, Jeff, like in, in the 90s, I think the Braves had a hard time selling out that stadium early on in the playoff run because I think a lot of Braves fans are like, uh, uh, took a wait-and-see approach. Like, let's see what they do. How, how are they going to blow it now? And I kind of feel like Dodger fan now has that same vibe. So I, I get the argument that you want to be in the playoffs every year because at least you have a chance. But maybe us missing the playoffs for a few years makes us appreciate it more. Because in 2013, I think that's what we went through, right, Jeff? Uh, yeah. But do you remember how much 2010 through 2012 sucked? Like, yeah. Like, and that's that's why I can't get on board with that argument. Like, uh -huh. and I, I think a lot of Dodger fans actually believe the Dodgers have some fundamental can't win in the postseason gene. And I think mm -hmm. that's the difference. I, I think if people really believed that getting into the postseason gives you a chance to win the World Series, but I think a lot of Dodger fans don't believe that. I really do believe it. I believe that most managers – are about the same. Managers can't do that much to win or lose games for you. I, I think your best chance to win the World Series is to put together the best team possible. And the fact is, you know, the Dodgers had that 0 for 20 stretch in the NLDS. If it's 4 for 20, which is still yeah. really bad, they sweep the series. Like, yeah. because it, the games were all close. If they get a couple key hits, even if they don't play well, they just play a little bit better than disastrously awful they sweep that series and, and probably play the Astros in the world series. You know, it, it's these little tiny things. And there's no reason to think that the Dodgers went over 20 in the postseason because of some fundamental flaw. You know, it, it wasn't Dave Roberts fault. It wasn't, you know, wasn't that Mookie Betts can't hit or Freddie Freeman can't hit or Trey Turner can't hit Trey Turner, and Freddie Freeman both hit well in that series. It was, you know, they had trace Thompson kind of got exposed at the wrong time. Cody yes. Bellinger never did figure it out like they thought he might. Chris Taylor hurt at the end of the season, so he wasn't able to get on track. And so the fact is they went into the postseason with a lineup that was about five people deep when they had the whole regular season as a real nine-man lineup most of the time. And, and that's really – that was the difference. And that's there's no reason to think that's going to happen again next year. In 2021 – it was Max Muncy and Clayton Kershaw both getting hurt the last weekend of the regular season. You know, if they had one more starting pitcher and one more Max Muncy, they probably beat the Braves in the NLCS last year and play in the World Series again. You know, the the only 2019 is the only one in this stretch that you could really say was Dave Roberts' fault. 2019 gave five NLDS. That was on Dave Roberts. There was no reason to have 
Clayton Kershaw pitched the eighth inning. When you had eight rested relievers, you have six outs to get. You know, I think we could figure it out without having this homer prone uh, Kershaw out there. That that's the only one that's on Roberts. Everything else, the Dodgers with a couple little different rolls of the dice could have played in five of the last six World Series. You know, and, and they didn't. And I understand why people feel the way they do, but there's not some fundamental flaw here. It's just that you know the postseason really is a crapshoot. And when you talk about uh, you know, if with 12 teams in the postseason, that means if everybody has an equal shot, that's what, uh, the, the 0.83% chance or 8.3% chance for each team. So even, and, and so even if you say, okay, with the Dodgers are the best team still, it puts them to what 15% chance to win the world series realistically going in. That means 85% of the time, something like this crap that happened this year is going to happen. You're going to get knocked out because of some stupid thing because the umpire missed a strike. And so Max Muncy was playing in and Hassan Kim knocked a double down the line or, or because uh, Mookie Betts' line drive went right at Manny Machado with, you know, or even in that game, bases loaded and one out and Will Smith rips the ball. And if that ball's 15 feet to the right, it's a three run double and the Dodgers win that game. Instead, it's right at the left fielder. It's just a sack fly. All these little things that could have gone different, and it would take a real crazy stretch of the imagination for me to think that that's because of some fundamental flaw. And so because of that, I am still always on board with get to the postseason, put together the best team possible, get to the postseason, and cross your fingers that, like in 2020, everybody gets hot at the right time or enough people get hot at the right time that you win. The Dodgers in 2020 – they hit with two outs. They hit with runners in scoring position. They pitched when they needed to. Even then, there was close stuff. If Manny Margot is safe at home, stealing home, instead of out by three inches, maybe that series goes differently. You know, But it didn't because the cards fell our way that year, and they will again. And I, I am perfectly content to go into 2023 with the hope that this year they go our way again. And and this is why we wanted to have Jeff on the show, right? Because uh, he's he's the host of Locked On Dodgers, so you can listen to his show all the time. I I feel he is the voice of reason when it comes to this stuff. I it, listening to you, Jeff. What it really reminds me of is just how cruel not only baseball, but I just think all sports are. Uh, you know, I, I want to just say this because Alicia and I are the only real LAFC fans on this show. So don't let a producer try to uh, convince you guys otherwise. It's just Alicia and I. That final yesterday, the the MLS Cup, Philadelphia should have won that game. They deserve to win that game. They were dominating that game. And then something just completely random, something crazy changes I mean, you're one man down, you have the backup goalie, and LAFC wins that game. And and I felt bad. I felt bad for Philly fan to lose that game and then to lose that night to the Astros. It, it was just the cruelty of, of, of sports. And you, you mentioned something that I, I think I haven't heard anyone else mention. And that was the the lineup going from being five deep instead of being nine deep, and that Trace Thompson got exposed. I haven't heard many people talk about that. I know that Bellinger was made to look like the scapegoat, but there were guys on there who struggled in the postseason. Mookie Betts struggled, but another guy struggled. And it's a guy that you recently talked about, and, and that's Justin Turner. Look, we all love Justin Turner. Like to me, I, it was this is part of the reason why we wanted to have you on the show. You had made an argument that Justin Turner's numbers should be retired. And, you know, for me, it, it makes sense because I feel of all these guys in this stretch, outside of Kershaw, that guy is a Dodger. Like that is a guy that I'm going to look back, even though he hasn't played his whole career with the Dodgers, Justin Turner to me is a Dodger and he has made contributions that are worthy of it. There's a couple of questions that I want to ask you about this, uh, Jeff. One, wh why do you think, uh, first of all, Justin Turner's jersey should be retired? And what's it going to take for this organization to change their policy about retiring numbers? Yeah, you know, and it's funny that I'm the one making this argument because I actually wrote an article five or six years ago saying that teams should unretire numbers and, and that they should instead 
have, you know, okay, your best pitcher, the Dodgers' best pitcher, next year you get to wear 32 because that was Sandy Koufax's number. You get to be Koufax next year, you know, and do that. You know, I don't know if I actually believe that argument. I don't know if I believed it when I wrote it, but, you know, it, it <laughs> you know, there, I, I do think retiring numbers is a little bit silly. I feel like it's not even necessarily the best way to honor a player because the only time you see that number is when you happen to look at that one part of the stadium, you know, whereas if it was on the field, it would be, you know, uh, it, it would be a much better way to honor the player. I don't know if there's a practical way to do it, but if we're sticking with the idea of retiring numbers, I think that it's a little bit silly that the Dodgers have this hall of fame rule simply because they're outsourcing their decisions. And, and I'll draw a parallel for you. Uh, the motion picture association of America, they put ratings on movies and, uh, there are people, there are parents. I, I'm a parent. I have three kids. I'm not going to let my son go watch a rated R movie at the theater. But I don't know what's in that movie, you know? And, and then if you get down to PG-13, my son's 15. There's plenty of PG-13 movies I'm not going to let my son go watch. I'm going to look at the parents' guide on IMDb, and I'm going to say, okay, what's actually in this movie? Uh, you know, what... And because different things affect different people, different ways and stuff. I'm not going to outsource my decision on what I'm going to let my children watch to the motion picture association of America. I don't think the Dodgers should be outsourcing their decision on what numbers are retired to the baseball writers association of America who, all right, I'm going to tell you guys a secret. Uh, when Harold Baines was elected to the hall of fame a couple of years ago, I actually talked to, one of the people who was on that committee that elected him, a, a, a former player, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say which one, there are 12 people on that committee. I talked to one of them, and he told me the reason that Harold Baines got elected was because they knew that Edgar Martinez was about to get elected, and Harold Baines had 500 more hits than Edgar Martinez. So if Edgar Martinez is going to be a Hall of Famer, Harold Baines has to be too. I don't want decision-making like that to be determining what numbers get retired at Dodger Stadium. You know, Gil Hodges, is he any more worthy right now of having his number retired than he has been for the last 50 years? Yeah. If his number was worthy of being retired, why hasn't it been retired since he you, left You know the, the story on since? that one, right, Jeff? The, the, how Ted what? Williams screwed him over? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, yeah, Gil Hodges should have been in the Hall of Fame a long time, or could have been, yeah. you know? If he should be in now, he should have been a long time ago. He's yeah. been dead for 50 years. You know, he hasn't done anything to bolster his case <laughs> in a long, long time. You know, and, and Clayton Kershaw is going to go in the Hall of Fame. Everybody agrees on that. Fernando Valenzuela, you could absolutely make a case he should be in the Hall of Fame, probably not based on his stats, but if right. we focus on the fame half of the Hall of Fame and the contributions to baseball and the impact on baseball, Fernando, absolutely a Hall of Famer. If he ever makes the Hall of Fame, the Dodgers will put his number up on the rafters. They haven't issued the number since then. It's retired. It's it, it's the worst of both worlds. We never see number 34 anywhere because it's not on anybody's jersey and it's not hanging up in the rafters. I say rafters. Dodgers say not rafters. That's a <laughs> basketball term. You know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Uh, up on the loge. Uh, you know, it, it's it's ridiculous to outsource that decision to the Hall of Fame. If a dude had an impact on your organization – then that qualifies that deserves or retiring his number, retire it, you know, and the only exception they have is Jim Gilliam. And he's a perfect test case for why uh, the kind of guy who should be retired. He played his whole career, his whole major league career with the Dodgers. After some time in the Negro leagues, he was a borderline hall of famer statistically. And then he stayed with the organization as a coach. And then he died while actively serving as a coach. He died. I just knocked over my dust and made bobblehead. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> you know, he died mid season. You know, it was, it, it was an emotional decision, but also it was the right decision to retire Jim Gillen's number. So that brings us to Justin Turner. Statistically based on wins above replacement, Justin Turner is the 21st best Dodger in history. And uh, some of those guys, we don't have to worry about there. There's uh, eight, eight, I think eight of them are currently in the hall of fame and Clayton Kershaw will make it nine. So nine of those 21 retired based on the merits. Jim Gilliam is another one. So there's 10. And then you've got Zach Wheat and Dazzy Vance who are in the Hall of Fame but didn't have numbers because they played before numbers. Don't got to worry about them. There's four other guys who aren't in the Hall of Fame 
uh, who played before numbers, so we don't got to worry about them. And so it's really, it's Oral Hershiser, Willie Davis, Fernando Valenzuela, and then you get to Justin Turner. And I might be missing one more in there. Oh, Steve Garvey and Ron Say. You know, those guys. That's a pretty good group. I don't think that's Yankees level. Yankees retired Paul O'Neill's number. It's like, come on. <laughs> Paul, Paul O'Neill, if, if if some bad committee later in life elected Paul O'Neill to the, to the Hall of Fame, he might not even have a Yankees hat on his plaque. He might be a, in a Reds hat. And maybe that's Dodger fan because Paul O'Neill killed the Dodgers when he was on the Reds. Yeah. But it's like, if you're retiring Paul O'Neill's number, you've taken it too far. You've lost the narrative. I'm not suggesting the Dodgers should retire Kike Hernandez's number. I guess they just did with Gil. Yeah, it's already retired. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, Jock Peterson, you know, uh, Jock Peterson wouldn't even be the first person you'd retire number 31 for, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's Mike Piazza or Mike, Max Scherzer. No, but uh, John you know, Shelby. It's, John Shelby. <laughs> John Shelby. <laughs> um, I'm not suggesting they go Yankees crazy, but I think Justin Turner is actually a pretty good line to draw. Say, okay, the impact he's had on the field. He's been a Dodger for, for nine seasons. He's been outstanding. He's been like the 21st, 22nd best player in baseball offensively since he came to the Dodgers. Like, that's really, really good. He's been very good for the Dodgers. He's been part of a World Series team. He's been a postseason legend despite being bad the last two postseasons. He's done great things in the postseason. He's a pillar of the community. He is an icon. Yeah, when he's done playing, Number 10 should be hanging up. Also helps that I was also Ron Say's number. Retired for yeah. both of them, you know, and you don't got to worry about turning into a Yankee situation and you just use Justin Turner as your baseline. Okay. We, did you have the impact that Justin Turner did or more? Okay. We'll retire your number. If not, sorry, Jock Peterson, you weren't around long enough. Sorry, John Shelby. You had that <laughs> hit, hitting streak in 1988. Other than that, you know, but yeah, I, I think Justin Turner is a very fair baseline to say, okay, JT, deserving a retired number. Anybody less than him? Probably not. So here's the thing. We had Kasten on, on the show. We asked him the question. He obviously doesn't like to talk about it. Here's the thing that drives me crazy. This organization is obviously very sensitive to everything they, people say about them. They hear the stuff. They know. And the fact that they won't do this. I, I mean, look, we, we lost Vin. Who knows how much longer we're going to have Harin here for? We lost, we lost Mike Brito. Brito and Harin. Harin has told us that he has gone to the Dodgers and saying, you need to retire Valenzuela's number. What I am concerned about is they're going to wait until Valenzuela dies and they're going to do it. And isn't the whole point of this is to recognize this person while they're still alive? I, I think you have a good point there. Let's honor Justin Turner. At the same time, you can honor Ron Say. You killed two birds with one stone there. One of them's a penguin. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, uh, I feel like you brought up Jaime Harin just to rub in the fact that I can't roll my R's. But uh, you know, <laughs> I, I, I try. My wife makes fun of me all the time. I'm like, little ruffles have little, little ridges. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I it's crazy. And Fernando, he's still in the organization. He's, and and they created this, you know, whatever the, the hall of legends, or I don't even remember what they yeah. call it. Yeah. And, and that's supposed to be a replacement. And it's just not, you know, the fact no. is there is a protocol in place to honor a player who's a legend on your franchise. And that is retiring his number. And when you haven't issued 34 anyway, like, and, and I understand they think that if they retire 34, it'll open up the floodgates. And, and that's why I, I want to start with start by saying, okay, Justin Turner's our baseline. Nobody worse than Justin Turner gets their number retired. We're not turning into the Yankees. But you know what? Throwing in, I don't think it would diminish the Dodgers at all. And it would absolutely uh, burnish their, their appreciation of history to have Ron Say and Steve Garvey and Fernando Valenzuela and Oral Hershiser and Willie Davis up there hanging on the loge level, you know, and, and I guess somebody would probably try to say you should also do David Lopes and Bill Russell. If you're doing Garvey and say, maybe you make an exception for them. I don't know. And, and, and that is where the, that's where the, the trickiness comes, you know, um, Lopes and, and Russell were both better choices than, than Paul and Hill. Um, <laughs> but you know, so maybe you make that exception for them. I don't think you need to because Bill Russell was clearly 
the the weak link of that infield. He played for a long time. He wasn't actually a very good player. And Davey Lopes had a lot of skills, you know, was a legend in some ways, but not as good as Garvey and Say. Uh, you know, I don't know where you draw the line there, but I think you can easily set it up so you're not worried about the slippery slope. You're not worried about opening the floodgates, whatever, uh, you know, cliche you want to use. And you can still honor guys like Fernando Valenzuela, who absolutely should have his number retired. Okay, great. That, I mean, that's the thing that we wanted to talk to you about because I, I actually like your argument here about Justin Turner. My thing is, is, if he ended up, let's say, getting honored before Valenzuela, that's going to be a huge problem for the Dodgers. It is. A and huge... he, Go ahead. Yeah, he never would before Fernando. Like, okay. And that's the thing, because, you know, if they change their policy, Fernando will absolutely be the person they change it with because it. his number's already retired. It's just not hanging up there. You know, he, he's still in the organization. I, I imagine. If they were to change it, I think they'd probably do Fernando and Oral at the same time. They're mm -hmm. both still announcing for the Dodgers, retire both of their numbers, and, and they could even publicly say, we're not going to turn into the Yankees. They could call out Paul O'Neill, just like I did on this <laughs> podcast just now. We're not going to turn to the Yankees and retire Paul O'Neill's number. Sorry, Mike Ramsey and other Mike Ramsey. You guys are out of luck. But, you know. But yeah, they, they absolutely should do it, and I hope they do eventually. And, you know, if somebody gives me 10 billion bucks, Elon Musk, I'm talking to you. I will buy the Dodgers and my first order of business will be retiring Fernando's number. You, you know, and here's here's the thing, right? And and that's what it makes it so sad because you you're right. Valenzuela doesn't have, in my opinion, Hall of Fame numbers, right? But it's his contributions, not only to this Dodgers organization, but to what he's done for baseball, especially baseball in Los Angeles, especially with the history of Chavez Ravine. What he does, that is recognition that that deserves to it. You know, the end of his career, it was rough to see him playing with the Angels, playing with the Padres, with the Orioles, right? But now we're getting to a point with a guy like Justin Turner, where to tell you the truth, he's a free agent. We're going to get into this offseason discussion with you right now, Jeff. Like, what do you do with a guy who is like, you want to be loyal towards him, but at the same time, I don't think you we can ignore And You said it the last two postseasons now. He hasn't delivered. What do the Dodgers do, not only with Justin Turner, but with these other free agents that they have? Yeah, you know, team options seem like such a good idea when you when you sign the contract. But then you get to the point where you have to, the team has to decide, you know, I think they'd almost rather have it be Justin Turner with the option. So that they say, yeah. oh, nothing we could do. JT exercises his option, you know, glad he wanted to stay here. You know, now it's the team that has to decide. And, and it's a hard decision. I, I will tell you, I don't believe that postseason hitting is a separate ability from hitting. I believe that Justin Turner was hurt this year. Uh, I, I think that shin injury fell on the ball off his shin. I and mean, we've seen with Andre Ethier, guys at that age don't recover from foul ball, don't recover from foul balls off the shin as easily as young guys do for some reason. You know, and, and I think JT was hurt. And for whatever reason, I think that affected him. And, and really, it's just it's his last 13 postseason games. Up through then, he had like a well over a 900 OPS in his Dodgers postseason career until the last three postseason series. This year, he was hurt. So really, we're talking about last year against the Giants and against the Braves. It's like, okay, is that really enough to say he's done, especially with how well he hit in the second half of the regular season this year? I think people, you know, if you look back at uh, Will Smith in 2019, and he struggled in the postseason. And people want to trade him. Oh, he's a bust, you know, and, and he had two bad weeks in September too. And they're like, see, you know, he had a hot start and then he sucked. Well, guess what? If the Dodgers don't have Will Smith in 2020, they don't win the world series. Right. And you know, it's not a separate ability. Guys have hot streaks and cold streaks. And sometimes the cold streaks happen during the postseason. Corey Seager was a terrible postseason hitter until 2020. And suddenly he was Babe Ruth, you know, and uh, Cody Bellinger, terrible in 2017 in the postseason, and he had some huge home runs and huge hits for the Dodgers the last couple of years in the postseason. Barry Bonds was awful in the postseason until like 2000, and then he was really good. And I, I heard rumors there may have been something else involved with Barry Bonds' <laughs> research, I don't know. But, you know, there there's so many examples of guys who 
were bad until they were good or were good until they were bad. And there's no reason to think other than the fact that Justin Turner is 155 years old, that he's going to be bad next year. His postseason performance, the last 13 games doesn't weigh on my personal decision at all. So really it's coming down to, can he still play? And I also think this shouldn't be about the money. It's about the roster spot because if Justin Turner deserves a roster spot, he deserves it at $3 million or $16 million because the Dodgers print money and wipe their butts with it. And, and there's, it's not our money. The Dodgers aren't going to lower the price of a Michelada if, if they don't have to pay Justin Turner. You know, you're going to keep paying more for tickets and keep paying more for concessions, regardless of what their, their payroll is. You know, it's all about does Justin Turner deserve a roster spot? And I, you know, we saw he played more DH this year than he ever has before, which means he's, he's aware that age is catching up to him. Next year, he's going to be playing more DH wherever he is. And the Dodgers, I think that's where the concern might come in because the Dodgers, we know they want to use Will Smith as the DH sometimes to get him out from behind the plate. It's a totally different game playing DH than playing catcher, getting him a rest that way. I think they're probably going to want Freddie Freeman to occasionally play DH next year just you know, to get him a break while keeping his bat in the lineup. Uh, everybody, the Dodgers are going to be a team that uses their DH to rotate among guys. So I'm not sure if they're going to feel comfortable having the same guy DHing for 100 games, which I think is probably what JT's future will be. That's going to be the question. And uh, what I hope is Justin Turner is the Dodgers, like you said, and there's room on this roster for him. I think, he, you know, maybe instead of DHing 100 games, he DHs 60 games and comes off the bench in 40 games. And I, I and that's a role that he would have to be willing to accept. Uh I wouldn't be shocked at all if if the Dodgers decline the option and then sign him to a different thing. There's a two million dollar buyout, so if they sign him to a, a eight million dollar deal plus the two million dollar buyout, he gets ten million bucks instead of sixteen million. Everybody can be happy about it. Uh, you know, he'll probably be able to afford his groceries still with ten million bucks. <laughs> maybe even be afford to buy gas in California with that much money. And you know, and, and everybody's happy there. And maybe he comes back and he's only starting. 110 games next year and coming off the bench and being that veteran leader and maybe even uh, doing the old phantom IL stint. And you know what, JT, you're a bench coach. Now you are on our team. We're paying you 10 million bucks, but we're not using up an active roster spot for you the whole season and kind of ease him into retirement and into a coaching role. You know, uh, baby face. Uh, I mean, uh, what do you got to add here? Uh, for Jeff, because I, I think you bring up a very good point in the sense, my concern is if you lose him, you lose that presence in the locker room where I think right now, I think he carries that mo the, uh, the most value. I'm, what do you think, babyface? Yeah, I mean, if if you take away, if you subtract Turner, JT, who else is that leader in that in that clubhouse? Is it Kershaw? I mean, we don't even know if Kershaw's coming back, right? Who else is going to take up that role that JT has done for the last 10 years. So it's like, you know, Jeff brings it. That's what I'm thinking they're going to do. I think they're going to decline and then they're going to figure out some other type of way to bring him back, you know, for, for the, for the next year. Cause I mean, I don't see JT playing somewhere. I mean, he did say recently too, that, you know, he, he wants to continue playing. I think he said it on AM 570 a couple of days ago, like he wants to continue playing. He hasn't heard anything, but you know, he's willing, I guess, to go somewhere else. If something doesn't work out with the Dodgers, but like I said, um, I don't. I don't see it. Who else is going to take that take up that role unless they find you know some other type of veteran you know like like Pujols and Freeze was. I mean, you have JT right there. Why why are you even going to mess with that? Yeah, and they've got you know they got Mookie Betts who has taken on more of a leadership role recently, but it's a different role. Mookie's still a superstar, you know, and and it's like you said. You mentioned David Freeze. You mentioned Albert Pujols. They had Chase Utley. They had you know guys like that who Russell Martin came back. You know guys who aren't great players anymore, but they have that value. And Justin Turner, I think the hard part is going to be him accepting that. And, and I don't think there's any reason for him to accept that right at this moment, because the fact is he did hit as well as he ever has from late June through the end of the regular season. He was very, very, very good. And so there's a decent chance that he's still a very good hitter and he could, you know, be a big contributor for the Dodgers. But I think what he needs to do is come into the role, understanding, you know, you're 39 years old, you're, we don't know what you're going to be. And 
because of that, you know, the Dodgers tell them you're not going to get 16 million bucks anywhere else. You're, you're going to get eight or 10 million bucks. So why don't you get that here? Let's, you know, all in one fell swoop. Is I don't think it'll be Dodgers decline the offer. And then later they agree to a deal with JT. I think it'll be all at once. Hey, we're declining this and we're signing him to this other deal instead. Uh, I think he wants to be a Dodger and that, you know, it really comes down to ego at this point. You know, you, you don't want to insult your, your franchise player or, you know, your team leader by saying, you know, we only want to pay you 2 million bucks. But I mean, there's a perfect example just a year ago, Clayton Kershaw had been making 33 million bucks a year for as long as we can all remember. And he came back for 17 million bucks last year. And, you know, JT, same thing. Uh, hey, Kershaw get his salary in half. Why don't you do the same? Let's do 8 million bucks. You still get your $2 million buyout. You can be totally happy with that. No, no hit to your ego. It's a, an acknowledgement of your age and your changing role on the team, but you can still be here to be this team leader. And, and it tells him, because realistically, I don't think he's going to get more than four or five million bucks somewhere else. And so it's, it's still an overpay, which tells him we still value you more than anybody else does. You are a Dodger and you need to stay a Dodger. Wow. So, so let me ask you this, Jeff. I, I don't know if you heard recently Stan Caston say that there might be some change because we, just like we did years ago, we have to allow the young guys uh, some room to grow, uh, which surprised me that he, it, does that mean it's an acknowledgement that these guys that he's talking about in the farm system, I mean, the these Vargas, I, I mean, does this mean Altman's going to get a chance? I mean, are they actually going to embrace a youth movement, Michael Bush? These are guys I actually have been rooting for. I, I want to see them ha have a chance to come out there. I mean, do you think they're actually going to do that? They need to do something, either play those guys or trade them. You know, Michael Bush is ready for the big leagues now. If he's not on the Dodgers, they need to use him to headline a deal for somebody else. You know, and, and the, the hard part is, the Dodgers never really had a moment where they did a full youth movement. You know, they had Jock Peterson one year and Corey Seager the next year and Cody Bellinger the next year and Walker Bueller the next year, you know, and right now they kind of have where their roster's coming together. Right now they, they have three starting pitchers who went into free agency. Their starting shortstop went into free agency. Their third baseman maybe is going to free agency. Center fielder might be going to free agency. You know, they have a lot of spots to fill. And I think, it's going to be a scary thing if they try to do a full youth movement because the fact is, as we saw with Miguel Vargas in September, guys don't always hit off the bat. You know, Gavin Lux was as close to a sure thing as there was, and it took him three years to really become an established big leaguer. And so the Dodgers, I think they'd be in trouble if they tried to do it all at once. Uh, and so I think they're going to have to be smart about that and, and, you know, figure out how to do it. And so you prioritize and really – I don't think – I know people are clamoring for James Outman. James Outman had some big hits. He also struck out more than half of his times at bat in the big leagues and in the minors. He had roughly the same strikeout rate in the minors that Cody Bellinger had in the majors. And minor league pitchers are worse than major league pitchers. You know, James Outman – I would put money if I was a betting man – presented by betonline.ag, uh, <laughs> I would put money on Cody Bellinger being better in 2023 than James Outman, uh, okay. whether it's for the Dodgers or for somebody else. I don't. I, I think James Outman has a lot of potential. I don't think he's as good defensively as Bellinger, and I don't think he's going to hit as well as Bellinger, uh, at least not off the bat. And so if the Dodgers put James Outman and say, you're our starting center fielder, I think it's – three weeks before fans are turning on James Outman because I think he'd probably bat 230 over the first three weeks of the season and strike out in 35% of his at-bats and people would say, oh, he wasn't ready for the big leagues. You should have should have kept Cody Bellinger, you know? And I just think that's the nature of coming up to the big leagues. I think Miguel Vargas is more of a sure thing with his bat. I don't know where he'd play, you know, if they, they might need – 30 or 40 of those DH games for Miguel Vargas because you can only hide him defensively so often. Uh, you know, but I think maybe they say, okay, you're our starting left fielder. Go learn how to play left field, get better at that and, and hit the ball. Uh, you know, and then I, you know, Michael Bush, maybe it, it's hard to see them saying, okay, Gavin Lux, you're the replacement for Trey Turner at shortstop. Uh, I don't know. Like, I feel like probably either Gavin Lux or Michael Bush probably gets traded this offseason, And I don't know which one, 
uh, you know, and it comes down to what they're looking to do in trades and everything. But I, I don't really think there's room for both of them on the active roster. And Michael Bush needs to be in the big leagues next year. So I think one of those guys gets traded. And then you're looking at the pitchers. You know, Bobby, Bobby Miller and Gavin Stone are both pretty much ready for the big leagues. I don't know if I see the Dodgers going with two rookies in their starting rotation right off the bat, you know, and maybe, maybe they start them in AAA and, and use them as the spot starters. And, you know, when Kershaw has his annual back injury, they bring one of them up for a while or, you know, there's going to be injuries, whatever's going to be. Uh, but I think both of those guys are going to be a big league pitchers this year. So I think there's ways to do the youth movement without totally committing to a youth movement. But I think some of this youth movement is going to be some of the youth moving to other organizations. You know, you mentioned uh, the the favorite whipping boy, I think, of, of the Dodgers, Cody Bellinger. I have to ask you, after what they did to him in this postseason, and I'm not saying it's not warranted, but after what they did to him, can they bring him back? And would Bellinger want to come back? Because in the most important game of the season, they basically told him, we're going to go with someone else. Yeah, it was interesting, especially because Trace Thompson is one of the few guys who had a higher strikeout rate than Cody Bellinger in the regular season. You know, Trace Thompson struck out more than anybody on the team except for Joey Gallo. Uh, and yeah, he he was more productive than Cody, but there were always those holes that that I think were pretty obvious to people. But the fact is, you know, Cody didn't do anything to earn that spot. Uh, it, it ultimately doesn't matter whether he wants to come back because he's not a free agent unless they decline if they unless they non tender him. You know, he's going to be back uh, if they decide they want him, and that's all that really matters. I think he's a Scott Boris client. I think he switched to Boris a couple years ago, uh, which may not have as much impact when you're uh, bad at baseball as it does when you're good. Uh, <laughs> but you know, I, I think Bellinger is going to come back motivated. What I'm hoping is that you know that I don't know if you guys saw the analysis on. Uh, I forget what site it was, some prospect site, uh, prospectslive.com maybe, about Bellinger's swing and kind of their theory that it's not the shoulder injury that that broke his swing. It was actually the the fractured leg that he kept swinging, uh, kept taking batting practice when he was in a boot. And the theory is that he developed bad habits then of weight distribution and everything because of the broken leg and that that's what bro broke him. You know, if it's fixable, I feel like the Dodgers are the team that could fix him. And, you know, Bellinger having a healthy offseason this year, if they commit to him and say, Belly, you're coming back, we believe in you, and we need you to spend the whole offseason figuring out how to hit again. You know, get that, you know, whatever it is that, that is broken about a swing, get it figured out and get fixed because he's 27 years old. He's a former MVP. There, there's just way too much talent there to just give up on him, and I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I think it could happen. I think they could non-tender him, but I really feel like probably he's coming back, and he, the plan is going to be for him to bat ninth uh, until he shows that he can do more than that. But really, the plan is spend this off season figuring out how to hit again, because if he can get back to hitting, he doesn't even need to be 2019 level. You know, somewhere between 2019 and 2022, fallen there, he's an extremely valuable player with how good he is defensively. I, you know, obviously there's a lot of things. They got a lot of free agents, a lot of decisions they're going to have to address. Uh, obviously, starting pitching, I think, is going to be a big one. Um, I want to wrap up the show talking about a guy who's one of we stand for him on this on this show, and that's Julio Urias. So it he already lost his first award. He already lost the the pitcher, uh, the National League Pitcher of the Year. And look, I as much as you guys, we we, we had we devoted a whole episode to it. But for me, this guy, the way this guy has pitched the last two years, has he been disrespected with the lack of awards he hasn't won, or even being in contention for awards? Uh, you may not like this answer. Uh, I don't think he's been disrespected. I think he's going to finish second in the Cy Young Award voting this year, and I think that's probably where he should finish. Um, he was the best pitcher in the league this year by quality, but Alcantara was almost as good for a whole lot more innings, 
And it's like for the analogy I use is if somebody says, I'll give you a hundred bucks an hour uh, for eight hours a day, or I'll give you 95 bucks an hour for 14 hours a day. You're going to take the 95 bucks an hour, even though it's less per hour because it's a whole lot more hours. And that's what all Contra was it. And if the difference in quality was bigger, I'd probably feel differently, but Alcantara was almost as good as Julio for a lot more innings. And, you know, the argument of, well, Julio could have been too, but he didn't get the chance to. Well, yeah, I know. The Dodgers system probably isn't set up for a guy to win a Cy Young Award right now because nobody on the Dodgers is going to throw 220 innings in a season. It's just not going to happen. And so, yeah, it sucks for Julio. You know, in 2021, he finished seventh, I think, in the Cy Young voting which I felt like was about right. You know, if you look at the other guys, uh, yeah, he had 20 wins. Wins are a team stat. Wins are not an individual stat. Win, wins are a team stat. And what he did going out there, going 20 and three, absolutely talks about how what he did to put the Dodgers in position to win games. But the fact is he uh, wasn't quite as good as the six guys who finished ahead of him. You know, his ERA was almost three. You know, I think Julio was significantly better this year than he was last year, even though he had more wins last year. I, I, I so I think seventh was about right in 2021, and I think second is about right this year. If he finishes fourth this year, yeah, I'll probably agree with you as being disrespected. But I really believe that Julio is going to finish second, right behind Sandy Alcantara this year in the Cy Young voting. Now, you you mentioned Boris. He is a Boris client. We feel he's gone. The way the Dodgers have used him, and I just someone I think is going to give him a lot more money than the Dodgers will. What are your thoughts? Do you think Julio is going to be a long-term a solution for the Dodgers? I hope so. Um, yeah, the the Boris thing. I I don't know what to read into that. You know, the the fact that Andrew Friedman even mentioned Scott Boris by name recently about. You know, a Scott Boris client, you know, that that plays into our thinking on things. I don't remember who he was even talking about or what the context was, but, you know, for whatever reason. And, and actually, I think the reason is guys hire Scott Boris because they want to get paid as much as possible for as long as possible. And the Dodgers aren't likely to be the ones handing out those as much as possible for as long as possible contracts because they are their goal is to be in the postseason every single year. And they, they've already committed a lot of money and years to Mookie and Freddie. And, and beyond that, it's like, I don't know, if you lock yourself into too many of those contracts, uh, you end up with a, a team like, you know, the Yankees after their hot run where, hey, we're paying a lot of money to the corpse of Derek Jeter and the corpse of Alex <laughs> Rodriguez. And, you know, and, and it's like, yeah, you've got the you've got the legends still on your team, but you don't have the financial flexibility to keep building a winner. And even more than that, you don't have the roster flexibility. You know, when when the Dodgers didn't sign Bryce Harper, I got yelled at for making the argument that there are baseball reasons not to give Bryce Harper a 13-year contract. It's not a financial decision, it's a baseball decision because Bryce Harper, what if he's great for 6 years and then lousy for 7 years? You know, a First of all, you don't even know when he's out. We don't know if Cody Bellinger sucks right now. We don't know if he's bad at baseball now or if he's had a bad couple of years. Imagine if this was Bryce Harper in the same boat as Cody Bellinger's right now, but there's seven years left on his contract. And at what point do you, you know, you're, you're locked into paying him the money, but at what point do you say, okay, but we don't have to be locked into the roster spot. We can really release this guy. You know, we'll have to keep paying him, but at least we won't use a roster spot. That's going to take at least a few years when it's a guy who, you know, you've signed to a bunch of money. You don't know if he's bad or not until hindsight kicks in, you know. And, and so there are a lot of reasons not to lock into big, long contracts like that. And I think the Dodgers are probably going to, for the most part, remain the team that doesn't give those big, long contracts. So if Julio is going to be a Dodger long term, it's going to be because he chose to not do the big long contract and whether it's, you know, the, we'll, we'll give you a four year deal worth more per year than anybody else was offering, but we're not going to lock into eight years of you or, or whatever it is, you know, I don't know, but he's going to have to 
except not a not getting a record breaking contract if he wants to stay with the Dodgers. All right, la- last one for me, Jeff. I feel this is the first uh, off season that Friedman has taken heat. Am I looking into this wrong? Um, I don't know. I I mean, there were whole Twitter accounts dedicated to Ad- Andrew Friedman. You know, I, I think <laughs> I think Friedman has taken heat in the past, uh, and I think it's going to depend on what happens now. I I don't think you can blame anything about twenty twenty two postseason on Friedman. He put together a team that won 111 games. He put together the best team in baseball. And, you know, there were holes, but it's not like those are holes that they could have anticipated and fixed in in July at the trade deadline. You know, uh, they wouldn't have – we didn't know Chris Taylor was going to get hurt and, and so, you know, he was not having a great season, but there's no reason to think he was going to be that bad. If anything, they would have replaced Max Muncy at the trade deadline, and he actually turned out pretty good. You know, they would have traded, replaced Justin Turner. He played well. You know, so I, I don't think you can really blame much 2022 on Friedman. And honestly, I believe Andrew Friedman is the smartest executive in baseball. And uh, I think he's going to do what it needs to, what he needs to do to put together another really good team in 2023. And fingers crossed that they're all healthy and get hot at the right time in October. And uh, that's really what will determine whether it was a successful offseason. We won't know for another year until these next two months are successful. Babyface, you got anything uh, for Jeff before we let him go? So going into the off season, what's uh, what do you think is one, one, uh, one big move or non big move that we're going to see for next season? Are we gonna, are they going to make a, an impact or are they just going to kind of take care of their own guys and, you know, some supplemental guys? I think we're going to see actually a, significantly different roster for the Dodgers next year than we had this year. Um, I don't, my gut is that Trey Turner is not coming back because, you know, people are throwing around nine year contract. The Dodgers aren't going to give Trey Turner nine years. If he comes back, just like I said with Julio, it's going to be on a a four or five year deal for a lot of money. You know, that's what they're going to be comfortable giving Trey Turner. I suspect he'll get something different. I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if they go with a, much less big name if they don't sign any of the big name shortstop free agents. And, you know, the one name that got thrown around recently was uh, uh, Willie Adamas from the Brewers. Uh, a guy like that wouldn't surprise me at all. A guy who can slot right in. He's not going to take Trey's spot at the top of the order, uh, but they don't necessarily need that, you know. Uh, but having Adamas bat in seventh in your lineup, that's a pretty good seven hitter. You know, good defense, solid hitter. Uh, you know, something like that wouldn't surprise me at all. I, I do think they're going to bring back Kershaw and Tyler Anderson. Uh, and I think that solidifies their rotation. And then I think we're going to see some of that youth movement starting to happen. You know, I think Hanser Alberto for as, as much fun as he was, I don't really see a role for him on this team next year. Trace Thompson, like I, I expect him to probably be traded. I don't think, I don't think there's really a role for Trace uh, next year unless he's willing to be that bench role again. Um, so, yeah, I, I think the rest roster next year is going to be quite a bit different, and I think it's going to be a combination of free agent and trade market. Uh, but I think my biggest prediction is that Andrew Friedman is going to do something that all of us say, wait, who? And then that person is going to end up having like three and a half war next year. <laughs> it was Tyler Anderson this year. Hey, Jeff, uh, you know what I was going to ask you real quick? In in terms of the, the, the biggest surprises in terms of what they're doing, what is the cat, man? I mean, what he did this year, is that an anomaly? Or I, I, I obviously the injury really, you know, I think leaves us scratching our head. Like, But I still don't know. What is this guy? Has he really turned a corner or... Was he just Alex Wood in 2017, the first half of the season? I think it's a little bit of both. I think he's a very good pitcher. Um, I, I think I, I have a theory that I've never run by anybody uh, smart enough to know if it's right or not. Uh, I think it takes change up pitchers a little bit longer to succeed in the big leagues uh, because change up is by nature a chase pitch. It requires guys to swing at pitches out of the zone. And I think it's easier to get minor leaguers to swing at pitches out of the zone than it is major leaguers. 
And so I think it takes a while for changeup pitchers to get the hang of throwing it in a spot where a major league pit, pit, uh, hitter will swing at it and not be able to hit it. I think that's why Ryan Pepio was a lot better in the minors than the majors this year. I'm still high on Pepio for that reason. I think that he will get it honed in. And I think it was the same thing with Gonsolin. His splitter is his best pitch. And I think it just took some time. You know, you remember Tony Gonsolin, e even though his, his numbers, his ERA was always good, is always like, okay, he only lasted four innings. He allowed nine base runners and somehow only allowed one run. You know, yeah. he had five walks and four hits and only, only allowed one run, you know, and because he didn't have that command, didn't have that swing and miss pitch. And I think what we saw was he had a little bit more of that this year, but still he's not striking out many guys, uh, but he's getting some of the weak contact. But uh, one thing that I discovered, my buddy, Mark Simon, who works at Sports Info, Sports Info Solutions, they track uh, shifts and uh, you know, they're the ones who announced a couple weeks ago with the banning of the shift, Corey Seager led the majors with, I think, 28 hits that would have been hits if there wasn't a shift, but they were outs this year, you know? And so instead of 250 something, Seager would have added 300 this year. Uh, well, Tony Gonsolin had the second most, uh, would have been hits that turned into outs because of the shift in baseball this year. Uh, Jamison Tyon was the only guy in baseball with more than him. And so with the shift being bad next year, there's definitely a chance that there's a regression there. Now, what they can't track is, you know, he obviously he's going to pitch differently knowing that there's not the shift. You know, you can, you can pound guys inside, you pound a lefty inside knowing, okay, throw something low and in, and he's probably going to hit it on the ground to the right side. And I've got the defenders there. So he, he'll, he'll change his pitching approach, obviously. So we can't just automatically say, he's going to allow 19 more hits next year than he did this year. But it's definitely something to keep an eye on. And, and I think next year we'll have a better idea of what, what Tony Gonson is. And I think part of the key is he needs to strike out more guys. He's got good stuff. And he that's the next step he needs to take in his evolution as a pitcher is getting more swing and miss to make up for what he's going to lose by losing the shift. I know I lied and I said that was the last one, but you just uh, triggered two uh, for me. One, who is in the Dodgers farm system right now that we're not talking about that we should be looking for in spring training? You know, I mentioned Gavin Stone earlier, and he might fit that bill uh, because Gavin Stone is a name nobody really knew last year, a year ago at this time. He pitched, he moved from high A to triple A this year and dominated all three levels, high A, double A, and triple A. He had a combined 1.4 something ERA. His worst ERA at any of the three levels was 1.6 this year. He was dominant as a starting pitcher. He is, he's the real deal. And he did something. He changed something because he wasn't that. He's throwing harder than he did in college. He's throwing harder than he did in 2021 in the minors, you know, and, and uh, his pitch mix and everything. So I think Gavin Stone is one of those guys that people started talking about later in the season, uh, but I don't think he's getting as much talk right now. Uh, and then there, I think there's other guys who I, I'm not a, a prospect expert by any means. Uh, there's a guy named Ronan Kopp who's only 19 years old and throws hundred miles an hour, left-handed pitcher. Um, there, there's another guy, the guy they got from the, is it who they got from the Blue Jays for Mitch White? His name is Nick Frosso. He throws hundred miles an hour. And for both those guys, it's all about command, you know, but but they've got some really, really good arms in the minors that are coming through. Both of those guys, I wouldn't be surprised to see them move up. Frosso is a little bit older. I think he's 24, uh, somewhere in that ballpark. And so he's a guy I could see making an impact in the Dodgers bullpen in 2023 if the, if he can get that command down because he's got the stuff. Ronan Kopp is a guy who, uh, a little further away, only 19 years old, but, you know, Somebody, if you've got that kind of arm at 19, it's pretty exciting. Uh, you know, I, I think Dodger fans are pretty good at being aware of the big names. And so it's hard to sneak up on, on guys uh, or sneak up on fans. Uh, you know, everybody knows Diego Cartaya and Bobby Miller. And those are definitely two guys to be excited about. But uh, I, maybe those guys I mentioned might be might fit that bill if we're not quite talking about them as much as we should be. Okay. And now this one really is the last one. All right. What is going on with Dalton rushing? Is this is this real? I I 
I feel like, you know, no pun intended, I mean, for him rushing through, you know, the farm system, I mean, is this guy, I mean, that legit? That dude can hit. Uh, I don't know if he's quite as legit as his 2022 minor league numbers make him look. He had better numbers in the minors than he did in college. But he also, he was stuck behind a very good catcher most of his college career. And so, uh, you know, I forget the dude's name, but he was one of the top draft picks uh, a couple years ago. And so rushing wasn't really a starter until this last year. And then to go to being the, the 40th pick in the draft or whenever the Dodgers finally had their first pick. Uh, yeah, he he is an excellent hitter. I think what we're seeing from him is pretty darn close to what he's capable of as a hitter. He's not going to hit 400 in the big leagues like he did in the minor leagues. But I think Dalton rushing is a great, great hitter and maybe not ready for the majors quite yet. I mean, he only played as high as, you know, I, I think did he even get the high A might've just been low. A. I yeah, think he I, just played in Cucamonga. Uh, but you know, a couple of years from now, a year or two from now, I could see him hitting in the big leagues. The question is, can he be a major league catcher? And I don't know the answer to that. I've only seen him play in person one time and he, he didn't look like a good defensive catcher to me. I'm not an expert on catching or prospects or anything. And so, uh, but watching him, I actually had the thought a couple of times, okay, well, good thing he can hit, you know, uh, <laughs> he's got a good, got a good arm. I'm not sure if he's going to be a big league catcher, uh, but he's a guy like, it wouldn't shock me if he made the big leagues in 2023. Uh, you know, if he hits, if he hits as well as he did in Cucamonga, he's not going to spend long in Tulsa. He's going to be up to Oklahoma city. And you know, if they have an injury, you know, if Austin Barnes gets hurt and they need a backup catcher, maybe, or if they just, you know what, let's, let's call the suit up and let him play DH for us for a couple of weeks. You know, it, it wouldn't shock me. I think he can really, really hit. So with well, him and then the talk of Cartaya, the trade, uh, the, this this ridiculous notion of trading Will Smith, that's bullshit, right? That's just that's just hot stove nonsense that I can't stand this time of year. Most likely, um, the the one possibility would be if they re if somebody really if the Angels called and said we'll give you Shohei Otani and Mike Trout, and we'll pay all their contracts, and all we want is Will Smith. Yeah, the Dodgers <laughs> are going to trade Will Smith. You know. Uh, and that's kind of the extreme. Uh, but, you know, I think there are trade packages out there that could convince the Dodgers to trade Will Smith, even though they don't have a catcher who's ready to replace him right now. Trading Will Smith would mean either go find another catcher or Austin Barnes is your starter. And uh, both of those aren't great options. So it would have to be a really, really impressive. Pack. I think it would have to be significantly better than what the Marlins got for JT Realmuto four years ago. Riamuto was the same age that Smith is right now, like literally within like their birthdays are nine days apart, like four years and nine days apart or something. So he's like the exact same age. Smith has been a little bit better with a little bit less time in the big leagues than Riamuto had at the time. Uh, they're different kind of players. Riamuto is better defensively than Smith. Smith is a better hitter, uh, but they're pretty, it's a pretty decent comparison. And I think the Marlins, if the Marlins were capable of shame, I think they would be uh, they'd be looking back on that Rio Muto trade and thinking, yeah, we didn't get nearly enough for JT Rio Muto. And I think the Dodgers are better at that than the Marlins are. And so they would have to get a package significantly better than what Rio Muto got for the Marlins. Go ahead, baby face. No, I was just going to follow. Um, I, I heard the, the initial when they drafted rushing was they see him as a long term catcher. So but that that again puts again, OK, you got if he's going to somehow make it to the big leagues soon, is it going to be a catcher? You know, you got Cartaya, you know, you have, um, you know, Will Smith, you know, what are you going to do with, with some of those guys? So, yeah. Yeah. And, and the fact is you can teach a lot of what it takes to be a good catcher. You know, Dalton rushing is an excellent athlete. He has a good arm. Uh, the arm is the part you can't teach a catcher. And so, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me at all if they do turn Dalton rushing into a good catcher. Uh, it's just, it's kind of the unknown on him right now. Because right now, I don't think he is a good defensive catcher. But like you said, they do think of him as a catcher. Uh, and 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 maybe that's, you know, you have to say that. You don't draft a catcher and say, we don't think he's going to stick at catcher, especially with your first pick in the draft. You know, if you're drafting a catcher, you're going to say you expect him to stick at catcher. Uh, but, you know, they don't always stick at catcher. And and that's okay. You know, Albert Pujols used to be a catcher. He turned out okay. 
you know, th there's plenty of guys who were catchers and then they weren't, and they still had great careers because they could hit the crap out of the ball. And uh, so while I think Dalton Russian could remain a catcher, uh, I think it's going to be his bat that gets him to the big leagues pretty soon. And there you have it, folks. Our special crossover episode with the Jetsons and the Pica Piedras, joined by the brilliant El Roy Jetson, uh, Jeff, the host of Locked On Dodgers. So make sure uh, the, the first listen of the day, as Jeff likes to say, uh, listen to Locked On Dodgers. As you can see, this man is a wealth of knowledge. We can't thank you enough, Jeff, for coming on the show and sharing this. Um, we love nerding out, even though we don't have baseball to nerd out about right now. But uh, thank you again for, for coming on and, and sharing your expertise. Well, I am happy to do it. And, you know, I, I love Dodgers podcasts. I think it, the world would be a better place if Dodger fans recognize the fact that just by virtue of us all being Dodger fans, we're already better than all the other baseball fans anyway. We don't need to fight amongst ourselves. We can all be friends because we already have that going for us. Look, you could be a Giants fan. You're not. So you're already <laughs> a lot better than, than most people. And so, yeah, Dodger podcast, we can coexist. You know, you guys, how often you guys do your show? We, we do well now in the off season, we're down to one episode a week, but I mean, before we were doing two episodes a week, you were, you're a daily podcast, right? You're five days a week, Monday through Friday. And we keep it to a half hour, uh, which as you can see on this timestamp, we did not keep this thing <laughs> anywhere close to that. Uh, you know, we do a half hour a day and, and it's like, like I say, I say first listen because Hey, download it, listen to it on your drive to work in the morning. It's on YouTube too. If you'd rather watch it, you know, if you, if you like what you're seeing right here, folks, you can see this <laughs> five days a week. Uh, it's definitely my face that brings in the viewers. Uh, but yeah, you know what? There's plenty of room for Dodgers content in our lives with all these podcasts that, you know, really ours and yours. It's, it's the two best. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. So there in you have order, it. Though, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, the great Jeff Snyder, host of Locked On Dodgers. And uh, just remember that this episode is brought to you by Bet Online, where the game starts. Make sure you follow us on the Twitters, subscribe to the podcast, watch us on YouTube so you can see the beautiful face that Jeff has on here. We want to thank you guys for listening. Nos vemos para la próxima. Adios. Adios.